Hello and welcome to this video on how to conduct a multiple regression analysis in the free JASP software. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm an instructor with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. I usually talk about multivariate statistical methods including structural equation modeling and factor analysis as well as multi-level modeling and latent class analysis. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to check out the description for additional resources including, including course that I offer through Quantfish. In this video, I want to show you how you can conduct a multiple regression analysis for free and also in a very convenient way in the free JASP software that you can download for free from the internet. And the link is provided in the description for this video where you can find the program. So this is really convenient for conducting all kinds of statistical analyses, including simple uh, analyses such as descriptive statistics, correlations, t-tests, but also more complex methods such as structural equation modeling, factor analysis, growth modeling, mediation analysis and reliability analysis. And I have a whole bunch of other videos on this channel where I show how to do analyses with these more complicated methods in JASP and I also have a playlist on JASP analysis so check that out as well when you have a minute. So here I want to focus on regression analysis and specifically multiple linear regression analysis. It's very easy to find once you're in JASP. I have already loaded a data file here which is called math and it's actually an SPSS data file and that's one of the very nice features of JASP that you can simply load SPSS data files or data files in a variety of different formats. When you click on this icon here, show main menu, you can just simply open data files from your computer or from recently open files um, that you've already used and you can load a whole bunch of or data files in a whole bunch of different formats. So once you have your data file loaded, you can simply click on the relevant analysis. In this case, it's this button here, um, regression and correlation. And so you can see that under this option, you have so-called classical or frequentist approaches, meaning correlation analysis with associated tests of significance, and that would be a Pearson correlation, for example, but also um, non-parametric correlation coefficients such as Spearman's row you can find there. And then we have linear regression, logistic regression, and generalized linear model. And then we also have a Bayesian analysis option here for correlation, linear regression, and logistic regression, which is also very nice. Here in this video, I will focus on classical frequentist analysis of linear regression coefficients. So let's click on that. And then you can see that you have a dialog window on the left hand side that looks similar to what you would find, for example, in SPSS. So it's all point and click, very easy to use. On the right hand side is already the output, which is one feature that I love about JSP that I don't have to maneuver between a data window and a um, syntax window or input window and an output window and that I create so much output and have to go back and forth when I want to change something. Instead, here you have everything in this one screen and when you uh, make adjustments to your input to your analysis then the output will be adjusted automatically and that is really nice I think because that way you don't end up with tons and tons and tons of output where you don't know at the end okay where is the table that I really wanted and you have to scroll like you would have to do in SPSS so this is a lot more convenient and also you can see that the output tables already come in a format that is at least similar to what we call APA style. So the American Psychological Association prescribes certain rules for tables and that is frequently used in publications in the social sciences. We follow APA style and so then here you have tables that are already pretty good looking and that can be used in publications. You can um, click here on a table and say copy and then you can paste it into your Word document or PowerPoint presentation or even latex. So it's pretty fancy and um, yeah, so that looks good. Let's get started and let's do our analysis so that these tables on the right hand side can be filled with statistical output. So here I have a bunch of test score variables in my data set. This was actually a 
study with students that had to take a number of cognitive tests, including a math test. So that's why this data set is called math. And so here's the sum score of the math scale. And so maybe we want to find out what predicts math performance. So I'm going to use this as the dependent variable to predict the math score on this test. And then I'm going to use a um, spatial ability test score, mental rotation, sum as one predictor. And predictors in JSP are called covariates when they are continuous. So you want to enter any continuous or interval scale level predictors here. You also can enter ordinal predictors there if you can make the assumption that they are equidistant in terms of their categories. And then any non-ordinal or non-equidistant ordinal and non-continuous factors you would put here. So any independent variables that are clearly nominal or ordinal with non-equidistant categories you would put under factors and then automatically JSP uses dummy coding for those which is also nice. So you don't have to do the dummy coding by hand. A very nice feature in my opinion. So another predictor that we can use here that's also continuous would be the KFT sum variable, which is the sum score on a cognitive abilities test. And so then you can see that the output on the right hand side automatically was adjusted when we entered our second predictor. And so it's very nice. You see the output remains compact and you don't get overwhelmed here. So let's take a look at what we get when we calculate the linear regression, um, just simply and follow the defaults of what is provided by JSP, you can see that there's a null model here, H0. And so this is one without predictors. So in the simplest case, in the default case, this has no predictors. So the R value, the multiple correlation is zero, R squared then obviously is also zero, adjusted R squared is zero, and there's a root mean square error. And then we have the H1 model, which has our predictors. And this one has a sizable multiple correlation of 0.682, which corresponds to an R squared of 0.466, meaning 46.6% of the variance in the dependent variable math score can be predicted by MRT, mental rotation score, and cognitive abilities test scores. And so the adjusted R squared here is only slightly smaller because this is a pretty, it's based on a pretty large sample size. So there's not much difference here between those two. This would be a little bit smaller, indicating only 46.3% were explained in the model of the variance. And then next is an ANOVA table that's also similar to what you would get in SPSS. In the ANOVA table we have for our H1 target model with the two predictors, the regression sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square and F value. The F value is significant, indicating that the multiple correlation that we see, saw here, 0.682, is significantly different from zero. That's what is tested with this F statistic. So it's a test for the overall regression model, the overall multiple correlation, and it shows that the multiple correlation coefficient is significantly different from zero. We also get the residual or error sum of squares, degrees of freedom, and the mean square, and then a total sum of squares and the total degrees of freedom here. And then in the coefficients table, we find the regression coefficients, the intercept for the null model here, which is probably not of very much interest to us. And then under H1, we find the coefficients for our actual model with the intercept being here negative 4.079. So that doesn't make a ton of sense. This would be the predicted math score for students who score zero on the mental rotations test and also score zero on the cognitive abilities test. So that doesn't make sense because that's not what happens. So the students will score more than zero and then negative points also aren't possible. So we could mitigate this nonsensical intercept by centering the predictors. If we centered the predictors, then this would give us the mean and that would be more meaningful. So the mean math score. Now, it doesn't affect the coefficients. So the regression coefficients are shown here in an unstandardized metric. So those would be the B1 and B2 coefficients for the mental rotations test. It's 
for the first regression coefficient and the second regression coefficient for the cognitive abilities test is 0 0.220. You can see there are standard errors. There's also standardized coefficients given here. And then we have T values and P values. So it's exactly what you get in SPSS as well. You can see that the mental rotations predictor is not significant. This P value is greater than 0 0.05, whereas the cognitive abilities score is highly significant as a predictor. And so this is the one that accounts for most of that variance that is explained here in the model. So there's a strong correlation between the cognitive ability scores and the math test scores. And then the mental rotations test does not explain anything above and beyond the cognitive abilities test. That would be our conclusion here. Now there's a little bit more that we can get. This would be sort of like the standard that you would also get in SPSS uh, for the default there. And you can make it, um, richer by going back to the input window on the left hand side and you can see there are a bunch of options model statistics method specification and plots so you can select more options under model we can look at stuff that we could add to our null model so we could make the null model here more meaningful so that we have a hierarchical regression in which in the first step we already have a predictor and then we see how r squared changes when we add another predictor so we can do that so we can say okay in the null model we will consider the spatial ability score only so i'm going to check this box here so then mental rotations the mental rotation score will be added to the null model and you can see oh all of a sudden the r value here is not zero anymore under h zero because now in the null model we include mrt sum so it's not really a null model anymore because we do have a predictor in there now and so you can see if we only use the mental rotations test score as a predictor of math ability then that would yield a correlation of 0.269 and a squared correlation of 0.072. So then that would explain 7.2% of the variance or adjusted 7%. And when we look at the regression for this model, then you, or for the ANOVA, excuse me, you can see that the F statistic is significant. So the mental rotations predictor alone is significantly correlated with the math dependent variable. So if we use it as predictor alone, we have a significant model. However, it becomes non-significant once we add the KFT into the model because that predictor is more, um, is a better predictor and it accounts for all of the variance that the MRT predictor accounts for as well. So then the MRT predictor becomes redundant. And that's what we see here in the coefficients table where initially MRT sum is significant as a predictor. You can see that here. But then once we add the KFT sum variable into the model, MRT sum is no longer significant. So that shows us it becomes redundant. We can also look at R squared change for these two models. When we go to statistics on the left hand side, there's a, an option here that says R squared change. And then this gets added to the first table. So now you can see there is an R squared change column, an F change column. So there's also an F test for the increase in R squared. And you can see that once we add the um, KFT predictor, we have an R squared increase of 0 0.393 and, uh, and that yields an F value of 280, which is highly significant. So this is a highly significant improvement in the fit of the model, in the prediction of the model when we add KFT in the second step. So this is something that you would also find in SPSS and it's very conveniently uh, added here to this initial model summary table in JASP. Furthermore, we can also look at descriptive statistics that then generates a new table at the very bottom where we have the sample size, which is always good to know about. So 384 is the sample size here. And then you get the means for each of the three variables. The, you get the standard deviations and you get the standard error of the mean as well. And then you can also ask for the semi-partial and partial correlations by clicking this uh, field here, part and partial correlations. Those get 
add it at the bottom in a separate table, partial correlations first, and then part correlations are the semi-partial correlations. SPSS has a similar option. Also, you can look at collinearity diagnostics, so meaning whether you have a problem with predictors that are very highly correlated. That's not the case here. So the tolerance statistic is given and the variance inflation factor, both of which here suggest that we're not in trouble with our set of predictors regarding multicollinearity. Furthermore, there are residual statistics. So you can get, uh, first of all, statistics for the residuals or error scores and you can get the Durbin-Watson statistic and other statistics for diagnosing potential problems with the residuals. Those get added in additional tables at the bottom here, so you can take a look at those as well. I find plots more useful, so when you go to plots, you can select a variety of residual plots. You can, for example, plot the residuals against the covariates, so the predictors. You can plot the residuals against predicted values. You can look at a residual histogram to check for normality, for a normal distribution of the residuals. You can look at a QQ plot of standardized residuals that makes it easier to see any substantial deviations from normality than you could see in a histogram. So that's also very useful when you uh, want to um, diagnose potential problems with residuals. You can see here are the residual plots and those dots should be randomly scattered around the uh, horizontal line in the middle, which is the case here. So there are no obvious problems with those residuals in this case. And then also the residual histogram looks pretty good, looks pretty normal. The QQ plot does not indicate any really dramatic differences or deviations from a normal distribution. So we can be um, satisfied with our residuals in this model. Under method specification, we could use step stepwise inclusion or exclusion criteria. This is something that I'm not a fan of, so I don't recommend doing that. These, the stepwise regression is not a good idea in my opinion. It's data driven and often leads to uh, arbitrary results. So that I wouldn't use, but it's also um, available here in JASP. I hope you found this video useful to learn more about how to use JASP for regression analysis. If you did, then please consider subscribing to this channel. Don't forget to check out the description for additional resources and I'll see you next time.